Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of Elevate, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swain. Hello, welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. We have an announcement to kick off our episode today that it is the last chance for early bird. If you have not registered yet for the Elevate conference and you are looking to take your fundraising event to school, be sure to register. Early bird expires in just two days on November 8th. This two day hybrid event will dive deep into everything you need to increase your fundraising at your next event. We're teaching you how to secure more sponsors, craft a compelling program and hit a home run for your fundraising. Early bird tickets are until November 8th, so grab them now. Additionally, we want to make sure you know about the nonprofit storytelling conference coming up in New Mexico in just a few days, where you can see Kristen, myself, and our special guest today. So we hope to see you there. And we hope everyone took the time to get out and vote yesterday. And as we dive into today's conversation, we feel like it's really important that we think about language choice. We can uplift and celebrate the communities that we're working with. We can remove barriers. And so we have invited an expert to the table today to join us in the elevator. I'm going to formally introduce him for those (laughs) who don't already know and love him. Please meet Frank Velasquez Jr., storyteller extraordinaire, social justice warrior, and community connector. With a heart as big as his vision, Frank dances on the front lines of change, armed with an unshakable belief in racial and gender equity. Whether he's dropping knowledge on the conference stage or storytelling behind the scenes, Frank's passion for social justice is as infectious as his smile. And he creatively (laughs) connects our stories, preserving the unique flavor of each like a delicious bowl of gumbo. (laughs) As founder of For the Hood and the mastermind behind the Ascending Leaders of Color Leadership Program, he's forging paths for peeps of color to leave with authenticity, courage, and joy. Because for Frank, advancing equity isn't just a job, it's a movement towards building generational wealth for communities of color to thrive. Frank, you're awesome. Thank you for giving us your time today and for being here to chat. Thanks for having me. This is exciting. So let's kick it off. Can you explain what deficit framed language is and the damage it can do to organizations who continue using it? Uh, Absolutely. So so deficit framed language Really, it's a narrative uh, that focuses on the negative aspects of a situation or an experience uh, rather than focusing on the strengths. Uh, some great examples might be, you know, like using at-risk youth uh, so or struggling reader. So as you can hear in those two situations, mm, yep. at-risk, that's a deficit, that's that's a negative kind of that's a negative experience. Uh, I, I often think about like even with Native Americans, the story that stories that we were told growing up were that these were savages and that 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 folks came across the Atlantic and tamed it. But there were thriving communities prior to the arrival of, of uh, those three those three boats. So so that's how I see it. And then I, I love how you asked and the damage that this land language can do to organizations who can continue using it. I might frame it a little bit differently saying, you know, well, the damage is really done to the to the people, to the mm, community. Yeah, yeah. And so as those those words are reinforced over generations, over generations, the harm is happening to them. And I and I would now to answer your question, though, uh, the damage it does to organizations is I feel like there has been a movement around since 2020 of, of really focusing on community centric fundraising mm-hmm. practices. And so organizations that continue to go down the path of harm, um, that's the damage that can be done. That they're I feel like they're if they're not up, if they're not, if they're not keeping up with with these changes that are happening in our sector, that's the damage that can happen with those organizations. I love that. I mean, I don't love that clearly, but that we're ta- that we're talking about yeah. it and then we're taking a look at how we're speaking about things because I think also the damage is that inadvertently sometimes we're working against our mission yeah. just simply by how we're framing what it is we're trying Absolutely. to do. I'm wondering, Absolutely. Frank, could you flip those two um, examples into a different frame? So instead of at-risk youth? Oh, yeah. So so first of all, and I didn't say this earlier, but the 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 alternative approach to to these to these to the language 
is uh, is acid base language. So often, yes. So we've heard at risk youth, and what what our brain does is we're, we become socially conditioned to hear certain words, and then we conjure up certain images mm-hmm. because we've heard these words over time. So uh, an alternative alternative to at risk youth might be something something as simple as uh, students who are in historically under resourced regions, or you could say high opportunity youth, which is what Goodwill Industries uses as mm. they describe uh, that population. Um, the second one, what was the struggling reader? Oh, struggling reader is like just, a, you know, uh, um, again, maybe a, a student who's in a low socioeconomic area, something like that. So what it does is it removes the it removes the negative connotation and that puts it on the person yep. and instead puts it on the region, puts it on the circumstances that they're in. It focuses on the systemic challenges or disparities that, again, have shown up throughout the history of America. So that's yep. that's how you can flip those two. Yeah. Well, I think if you are looking historically at the nonprofit sector, well, not even historically, let's look right now, the nonprofit <laughs> sector, in the word alone, nonprofit, we're starting with defi- with a deficit frame, right? Nonprofit, instead right. of thinking about our businesses as for community, for impact, Social for impact. enterprise. Yeah. Um, so big picture, where do you feel like we could be doing better in this sector? You know, I think the biggest first step in, in pretty much anything that's been harmful is to acknowledge it. Mm. And so when you hear organizations beginning to acknowledge the harm that they've done, and whether it's through a statement and then ultimately through actions, that is a very big first step. Because um, as I mentioned a second yeah. ago, we tend to blame, even if we're not outwardly blaming, the words that we use tend to blame the clients for their situation versus uh, as I mentioned, the, the systemic uh, disparities that were always present that kept certain groups down. And we can go again throughout history, yeah. Native Americans, the genocide of them, uh, uh, slavery, uh, internment camps. So you could keep going on and on and on and really describing how this has shown up throughout our history. Yeah. The way that organizations frame their story and the language they use we've been talking about are often some of the biggest pieces <laughs> to moving mission forward. And I think one is is awareness of that even as something that needs to be addressed or they need to think of. And then we're all in nonprofits. We know all the layers that happen and sort of the move toward change sometimes is more incremental than we'd like. Sometimes there's a lot of having to move stakeholders forward. So for somebody sitting in the center of that who's clear, like, yes, I get that we use this language and we're telling stories that are actually not naming the barriers mm-hmm. and what we're doing to eliminate the barriers, but are actually putting the barriers on the people right? and, mm-hmm. and continuing them to suffer to those barriers. Where can folks even start? Because I think sometimes with big change there is this paralyzation that happens just even at understanding like where do i start to impact this such a great question i think one of the biggest fears i hear a lot from fundraisers is you know they're they're afraid that the donor is not going to give if they frame it in in an asset-based way um and my response to that is if it continues to do harm um then then you have to reconsider or just re-educate or or educate our donors further. Mm. So where to start, I think is probably there. You know, I I, you know, I'm not gonna name the person, but <laughs> but a couple of years ago, um, this is a major fundraiser. We had a conversation and they said, Frank, this the donor-centric model works. Uh, there's money coming in. I don't know too much about the community-centered model, and until I see different, I'm going to continue down this path. And it was so disheartening because um, my response back w- would be, "Yeah, maybe you're making, maybe these organizations are getting money, but do the do does poverty still persist? Do these issues mm-hmm. still continue? And they do. Yeah. And so, any short-term gain of money, you know." Um, uh, to me is not worth it if you're continuing continuing to do harm in uh in regards to how we describe people how we talk about people uh i can even go as deep as a personal one for me where where i i said something or i was taught all of these donor centric practices focused on on a client's 
tougher parts of her life. And we did not get her permission, her consent, or even though we said we would, uh, in regards to the uh, her reading the final draft, uh, she got a hold of it after we did this. And mind you, I had thought we had gotten the, her consent. It doesn't matter at that point, I'm leading the organization. And she was furious. And you're like, you just focused all on my bad things of my life. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about what I'm doing now. You didn't say anything positive mm -hmm. about where my life is going. You just focused on that. And so again, similarly, I would, if I had, if organizations, I'm trying to, I'm reading the question again, uh, where can they even start? It's just ensuring that they don't do harm. Just talk, uh, get their, get clients consents if they use stories of clients um, and, and really have that deeper understanding of, is this for the good uh, versus it's just for getting money uh, to continue the organization? Because if you're perpetuating harmful stereotypes, it's not working in my opinion. Yeah. Well, and I think that sometimes that donor centered approach is actually extractive, right? From the folks right. that we're supposed to be in community with and the folks mm -hmm. that we're partnering with to move all of us forward. And so I think the replication of the systems of oppression, people get really defensive around that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they do. Be, they like, do. You know, I, I, that's, that's a hard thing to hear. Yeah. It's an even harder thing to sit with and either make amends for or choose a different path forward yeah. and so I think um, a lot of people step back because they're like I, I don't want to have that conversation with, with a major donor I yeah. don't want to have yeah. you know and so I think it's this is a long-term trajectory of justice this right. isn't just I've got to get 10 more yeah. 10k more in the can so that I can get everybody off my back for my fundraising budget this year yeah. Yeah. yeah, what I, what I often say, Kristen, and I appreciate you saying that because what I often say is that I would never advocate for any fundraiser to hit somebody over with a hammer. It's mm -hmm. like you know your donors, the ones that you feel are going to be approachable would would sit and listen with it, mm -hmm. then hit them with the hammer. If yeah. you <laughs> might be a little bit resistant, um, chip away. That's my favorite phrase. Just chip away. You know, I've had those experiences where I've had to have these crucial conversations with donors were one particularly with the organization I led and it it and it resulted in a really positive experience it just it, I needed to help her reframe how she viewed the students that we supported and and so yeah you chip away at the ones that are going to be a little bit harder but the ones you know that you know that are ready have that conversation well and that's I think in the end that's why dominant cultures are dominant cultures right, right? yeah they're not asked to seed space or mm. to pull in multiple perspectives sometimes and that that's the work well and i would advocate too that language evolves and changes yeah. and so i think that there is always i mean i think the good donor is the donor that wants to lean into the space and say help me understand and teach me but obviously not every donor is there but as we start to understand language and language evolves and changes, I mean, we have terms now in culture that we didn't have language for 10 years ago even. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. And so I think that to your point, Frank, when you were in leadership of an organization and you started to have these conversations, what is the like evolution that can happen within the organization when they start to do this asset-based work? How does this impact the organization? from a leadership standpoint it impacts it it can it can impact it greatly like in a positive way so the minute i started to shift and mind you one of my own staff was the one that shared with me and said frank our students our students don't like to be described mm -hmm. the way that we're describing them or that you're planning to describe them and that hit me hard because <laughs> again these were things that i had learned and i was like oh my god you're right and so i think the evolution of language are certainly starting at a point where that language shifts. It automatically shifts how people hear it. And I think that's the most important thing. If I mm -hmm. say it differently, people are picking up on it. If I say, if I lead with saying, hey, um, you know, the south side of Tucson is one of the most beautiful uh, 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 regions in Tucson. It's got music, they've got food, they've got dance, you know, it is so vibrant. And it's also one of the most historically under-resourced regions in our in our in our community. I'm leading with what is beautiful about yeah. it, 
And then I can say, and and there's challenges here. So to me, that's a great way of kind of always ensuring that we're talking and we're uplifting. We can still talk about the issue and the problem, but the 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 thing is, is we should be leading with the aspirations and strengths of the community versus saying, oh, here's this poor community and here's everything that's bad. Because again, our brain um, searches for biases, uh, yeah. and it's a way of protecting ourselves. Right. Uh, so when we when we lead with that, we're only reinforcing it. So, so disrupting those brain patterns is just simply flipping what I just said. Lead with the aspirations, and then you can talk about the the issues in the community. It reminds me of an organization that we were working with several years ago, where um, they served a student population that was, um, at the time, defined as at risk and homeless. And the students mm. came and said, "This is not how we want to be defined." That is happening to us. That is not a choice we're making, and that's not who we are. Mm-hmm. That is happening right. to us. And so the students got involved in actually being a part of the conversation about how do we define and ha- bring people into the conversation about who you are. And you know, beautiful language came out of that conversation. Like, I'm an artist. I'm mm-hmm. aspiring. I'm you know, on the edge because I've been pushed out by society. But I'm, you know, I have dreams, I have aspirations that that sort of shift was a powerful engagement with the client base and the community and service, but also then created a really cool narrative to be able to share with donors and bring donors along so that the language evolution was something that could kind of be both a revolution within the organization, mm-hmm. but also a education moment for donors. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we're going to talk about this in a bit, but, but for sure, when I hear you say how those donors are now receiving that message, I mean, who would, who wouldn't want to give from a place of support versus a place right. of pity when you hear <laughs> <Yeah>. the <those> story, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and again, historically we talk because, oh, those poor kids, uh-huh. let me give them versus what you just described students saying no these are my dreams and that's where and again I know we'll talk about it in a bit but that's where the transformation happens where donors are really feeling what that community that they're a part of really looks like and what they're striving for yeah we all make fun of the like commercials that were like the sad animals in cages oh or God. the <laughs> you know for pennies a day or a cup of coffee a day but that sad. was yeah that, that was that was like deficit based where we were framing and looking yeah. at oh these poor kids or these poor animals help them out of it pity versus really thinking yeah. about our missions are much more complex and robust than that and what we're yeah. doing is much more impactful than that too it's yeah. a lot of i think that's been endemic in the sector yeah you know it's baked into the have and have nots it's baked into the oh i'm going to use my dominant position to help right here right you know that that we look around and define things that we can do that way versus it's like pennies for the poor i don't want pennies for the poor i want to end poverty exactly (laughs) that's Exactly. exactly right exactly so frank once so once folks can see that they're utilizing deficit frame language and they move into this idea of asset-based language. Can you talk about the move to transformative language? It's interesting because I, I love this question. And, and as I was reading it, I wanted to start or lead with by saying asset-based language is transformative. Yeah. Mm. And to me, then it becomes consistent. The more that you use it, and again, I know we'll talk about it in a, in a sec, when we can help not just donors, but any person who might be a stakeholder for for uh, the mission of a nonprofit, see things in a way that that is not transactional. That is absolutely like this is your community. This is our community. Uh, that's where the transformation happens. So it begins with asset based language, and and really, as I said, those are to me those are interchangeable. Asset based language yeah. is transformative, and then it's all those other added pieces. You can talk about you know, overhead differently, you know, don't call it overhead, call it core mission support. Um, You can talk about all these other pieces that helps donors really see the impact of being involved in certainly those languages. It's literally what I've said before, just disrupting those brain patterns that we're used to uh, and that we've been socially conditioned to hear certain things, break out of those patterns and and find a different result. I almost feel like the transformation is the result. I like that you, I like how you framed it, the consistency, just that continuing to show up, continuing to put 
the assets forward. And then what comes of that and your practice of that becomes contagious and transformation. Yeah. And something that your donors walk away also framing differently. If the stories that we tell that like stick, that people think about, that they walk away thinking about, if those stories are based in asset based language, they'll tell the story differently. So you create a mm -hmm. different sort of ripple effect when you're absolutely centering yes. your stories. This is big. This is good. <laughs> I love that we're talking about this. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back talking about language and why it matters. Unleash the power of events to energize your donors and amplify your mission. Join us at the Elevate Conference in 2025, where you'll learn the essential tools for planning a successful fundraising event. Book your tickets now for March 12th and 13th. This dynamic hybrid conference, hosted at Avenue in Portland, Oregon, and streamed live for our virtual audience, will equip you with practical tools, demos, and templates that you can put to work immediately. Don't miss out. Secure your spot today at Elevate 2025. Visit elevatenonprofit.com to register now. Elevate Conference 2025 is brought to you by Swim Strategies and the AV Department, powered by elevatenonprofit.com. Welcome back. We are here talking about the power of language. Frank, I'm wondering if you can talk about what resistance to asset-based language looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's it's new. And usually when I have these conversations with fundraisers, um, I'll state at the beginning that, look, this is new information. All I ask is that you process it. And if you've got additional questions as we're going through it, let's go through it. And I will still have some people in that space feel a little resistant. And I'll give you an example where somebody said, well, what if this asset-based approach just becomes another trope of just, mm -hmm. they didn't use the word manipulation, but basically saying, it felt like in the statement that they weren't fully buying into using asset-based language. Um, I didn't respond to him uh, or them. I don't know if it was a him or a her. I didn't respond to them because we were still moving through the through the chat box. It came up quickly, then left. But I saw it in the survey uh, feedback form. What I would have liked to have said to that person was, well, in the absence of a different approach, you know, what would you do? You know, if 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 these are my only two choices, I'm going to go with the asset based approach because I know it's much more uh, community centered. I know it's much more uplifting to the communities that we serve. And if somebody ends up using it in a manipulative way, you know, um, I, I can't control that. All I know is that this is a way that we ha it's a starting point. We need to have a starting point and how it moves through. And as Sam said earlier, you know, the, the evolution of language happens anyway. What I'm saying today is, uh, that is asset-based may not be in five to 10 years and we just continue to evolve. So I, I, I wish I would have been able to say that to that person in real time is like, in the absence of anything else, you know, I'm gonna, I would recommend, highly recommend using this approach because of how it chooses or it starts to disrupt those brain patterns on how yeah. we talk about communities and it absolutely starts uh stops the process of of perpetuating harmful stereotypes yeah well i think part of this work when whenever like there's a number of areas you've touched on frank you've touched on ethical storytelling and the importance of consent you've touched on the power of storytelling and the language we use um and you touched on community-centric fundraising versus donor-centered fundraising and i think Whenever we dive into work that is intended to evolve, to move the <laughs> sector forward, we have to look at progress, not perfection, right? Like mm. we have to be willing to explore and ask and learn in order to see change and impact grow. And there will be times that maybe what we say isn't what we hope the impact will be, or maybe we have an unintended impact. But I think that that's so much of what you're doing. Your work is so centered on helping people to feel like they can start to move into the conversations and start to be having these conversations and try things that maybe right. aren't, you know, what they've always done before. So I'm a little just curious for folks, can you talk a little bit about your work specifically with Ford to Hood and how that work is helping sort of create some transformations or at least get people on that path of moving toward progress. Oh, absolutely. I think 
Um, as we were, so it, I'm going to start it in a place that doesn't sound like it's connected to what you asked. Uh-huh. It's, it's getting there. So the Ethical Nonprofit Summit, you know, that just completed last week, uh, as we were preparing and, and, and I was one of the, uh, the, the organizers of it, as we were thinking about, all right, well, we have VIP packages. What might you offer, Frank, as a VIP, you know, um, thing? And I thought a language audit. I said, mm-hmm. so simply just bring me your end of your appeal, maybe one from the past. Let's look at, let's look through it together. And that's a really great starting point from, from a, a from a, a fundraiser standpoint of like, here's what I've written before. Can you just look at it and tell me what, uh, where, where the gaps are, or where the deficit frame language appears? Um, it's beautiful because I've already gotten more than a few of just wanting to start that process. And one uh, beautifully said, I'm ashamed to say that I said, you're going to see a lot of deficit frame language in my year end appeal. And I'm like, well, we're, it's a starting point. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then for organizations, I think very similar. I think a language audit in regards to what their processes and pro- policies look like, uh, flexible scheduling, you know, that's, that's to me is an equitable process. If you're somebody who, as I meant, uh, I didn't mention this, but generational wealth gaps between white folks and people of color, uh, it's 10 times more than black folks and it's eight times more than than brown folks. That alone says there's some inequity. So how can an organization step up is look through some creative ways to make equitable changes in your policies. Mm, and to me, flexible yeah. scheduling is is a big one. Working remote is a big one. If, if it's not uh, needed to be in the office X amount of time, really look at those opportunities to to be creative and helping your your employees be in a space that they feel that that they can stay in and and, and be loyal to. I think the pandemic taught us and evolved <laughs> a lot in the way of folks' willingness to use technology to help close gaps. And I want to go back to something you just said about um, you're an organizer for the Ethical Nonprofit Summit. And although it has passed, is that something that people can still, there was a lot of great content that day and you had a ton of amazing speakers. Is that something people can still access or is there a way to get involved in future summits? Uh, yes, I, this is the first of its kind. So uh, to your Yay. first part of the question, I don't believe that they can access now because you had to purchase it ahead of time. The recordings were going to be are good for up to three months. This was in September 19th ish. So October, November, maybe till December 19th. But I can ask the organizer for sh- the creator of the conference for sure. Um, but it's not the last of its kind. We're already right. starting to plan for net for 2025. Well, we had about 300 turnout. And uh, more than a few said it was amazing simply because it was all focused on those things you said, ethical storytelling, community-centered practices, and things like that. Well, it's an important discussion. So we'll make sure to link folks in the show notes to understand how they can access the summit because it was completely virtual. So it was accessible to everyone to be able Mm -hmm. to participate and regardless of where you were. So we'll Mm want to pull that forward as a resource for folks. Great. Um, So often... We talk about transaction working against relationship building Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. staying immersed in transactions being sort of not helpful in cultivating (laughs) relationship. And so I'm curious about when we think about deficit framed language, how that can actually inadvertently restrict money. Can you talk about how transactions and transaction focus language impedes actually building relationships? Oh, absolutely. And mind you, this is probably one of the biggest pushbacks that I get uh, because we hear it all the time. For 50 bucks, we can get this. For 100 <laughs> right. bucks, you can get this. So right off the bat, it sounds like a transaction. Oh, well, if I do 200 bucks, then you'll get double the 100 thing. And so it, so there, what it's inadvertently doing is it's not connecting the donor to the organization and, yeah. the, and its vision and its mission. So so I often advocate for leading with the mission and the vision. And think about food insecurity. You know, you can say, you know, hey, we're a food bank and we give food. You know, we can feed uh, 50 for 500 bucks. We can feed 50 seniors, blah, 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 blah. Whereas you can still say the elements of that, but saying, you know, our, our vision is to eliminate food uh, insecurity. Uh, we want to make sure that there's food for everybody and your $500 can help us towards that that vision. It's a much different way of framing yeah. it 
versus a transactional point uh, and then using in division. And you can even combine those elements. You can still say, you know, your $500 is going to uh, feed 50 older adults in our community and really help us make a move toward uh, eliminating food insecurity in our community. So again, there's ways to do it, but if it's strictly just for 50 bucks, for a hundred bucks, for a thousand bucks, that's where we're inadvertently restricting the gifts uh, because then they might only give the gifts in a programmatic way yeah. versus in an unrestricted way. When you're giving gifts towards the vision, you're basically telling the the organization, I, here's your here's the money, use it any way you want. And as we know, in the nonprofit world, we need those unrestricted <laughs> dollars to do the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're so hard to come by. And it happens yeah. in event fundraising all the time. That paddle raise moment is the moment yeah. where all of a sudden you went from this like compelling, impactful narrative that you've been building through your event about the work you do, the impact you have, the mission, the client you serve, the transformation that the client had. And if you've done it well and ethically, they've told their own story, please. Um, but what you move through people through this journey and then immediately move them into transaction when you start saying for your ten thousand dollars you can for your five thousand dollars you can and you restrict your giving and like the event fundraising is so often the one opportunity people have for unrestricted giving to say we need this money to keep the lights on but that's not super sexy so people end up attaching you know, you can send one kid through the program or you can feed one family and then restrict not only their giving, but also then lose that opportunity for those important funds that are needed for all the other things. But also, I yeah. would argue beyond like literally locking up the funds to have to right. be dedicated to that thing, you're restricting your donor's ability for their mis personal mission to be bigger. Right, yeah. yeah. Like there's the literal restriction that's yeah. happening, but then there's actually this restricted moment where you're not allowing your donor to come into the asset space with you and really transform. That they right. you're teaching them, no, I'm, I'm gonna ask you when we need this thing, right. or I'm gonna ask you for this specific amount, and this is how you're gonna measure impact. And so we get really cranky with donors when they're like, why don't they understand we need to keep the lights on? It's like, well, because you haven't because we're set them like up it. to you do it. Yes. You haven't set yeah. them up that that's important and that they can be transformational I, in that way. Right, and I would even add it a step further, just not just individual donors, think about, foundations that give and they they say um you know uh, your your um your your uh, expenses your overhead expenses need to be between 10 and 15 uh. percent that's literally impossible to do the great work that needs to be done and so sh changing that narrative shifting that language how we say things being saying to the foundation look i'm applying for this but i'm going to tell you how unrealistic this is any little opportunity that we can shift that narrative and and we need to do. And, I, and I'll say this one last thing in, in my community in Tucson, we've got about three or four foundations that have adopted trust-based philanthropy mm -hmm. and have moved Thank really goodness. away from these restricted gifts and are giving more and more unrestricted gifts. It's really, and again, that's even part of uh, the deficit framed approach versus an asset based yeah. approach. Yeah. It's trusting the community that they know how to use the dollars. They've never had access to those dollars because of systemic differences or disparities. Yeah. Trust that they know what to do yep. in regards to moving moving the needle, uh, because right now it's not working. It just isn't. Well, so we need to come up with new strategies. The, yeah, that funding model though from the like foundation world has restricted us for so long that not only has it limited what's possible in impact, like it has re literally restricted our yeah. missions. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we can't hire the professionals that can actually impact the issues that we're trying to resolve. And I think that moving into more of a like reframe, positive frame, how are we actually going to manifest the visions that we have and the work that we do now is something that to your point should be showing up in lots of different places, not just showing up in a conversation with a donor or a grant yep. that you're writing. How do you see language changing when you think about like approaching a sponsorship solicitation or the like s different audiences you're talking to? How is this change impacting those audiences? 
I think similarly what what we just said, I think a lot of the in terms of sponsorships, it's it's painting a new picture, creating a new narrative to those sponsors mm -hmm. of the larger impact and what the need is. Uh, the transparency, um, I think, helps as well. It's just. And I see this even in I, I have a day job and uh, it'll remain unnamed, but it, it's it's a 501c6 nonprofit, but they still seek dollars and sponsors, just as you asked. And often I can see and I'm not the person that's seeking them. I can often see that that dynamic of like saying what they feel that the sponsor <laughs> wants to hear yeah. versus the larger conversation of like, look, this is what we need and this is here's where we're struggling and this is your community. So again, to me, it's just using that asset-based and creating a sense of belonging, which is what I say in my session uh, when we went uh, in a couple of, uh, next week, yeah. uh, that we'll be talking about, I'll be talking about that. Creating a sense of belonging with the sponsor, I think will go a long way and should go a long way. Will it be 100% successful? Probably not, It's it's a, it's a shift. But I think we need to start taking those steps in that direction in order to to secure sponsors that I would even say kind of to Kristen's point at a higher level than they've given before mm -hmm. because they have a fuller picture of what the needs are. It's yeah. funny. I would actually say that um, not all corporations, but many corporations actually are already doing this work uh, because they're looking at asset based language for employee retention. They're mm -hmm. looking at how they mm -hmm. reframe their narrative for consumer retention. And I think we're actually behind in the nonprofit sector. So I actually have seen that when you speak from the strengths and the the benefits and the impact of the work, it actually moves the sponsor along with you further faster. Mm -hmm. I have seen that in event programming as well, like your event script and moving an audience. That sense of belonging is so important right now. We're seeing that that is a huge motivator for why people support and give is that sense of bigger connection, bigger impact, collective action, mm -hmm. being a part of something outside of myself. So I think that um, while it may feel foreign to some, it's overdue in other areas and it might allow the nonprofit sector to catch up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Frank, I'm wondering too, I'm thinking about the impact of deficit framed language for trajectories of nonprofits. Thinking about um, you know, what what is that vision forward when we're fulfilling on a part of our mission? Mm. And that if we're constantly defining people by the deficit then what do we do after that, right? Like, let's say we've, we've, our mission was X to fix X deficit and we've done it. Do we cease to exist? Like, I feel like it's baked into limitations as organizations right. that if we're coming from a place of not only asset, but transformation, mm -hmm. that we actually could expand our mission in a really compelling way to envision a different future not yeah. only we're getting rid of this deficit but we're collaborating we're building we're co-collaborating yeah. co with all these other people to build this transformational world or community or neighborhood do you see like do you see folks in organizations when they make some of these shifts start to actually think about the potential of their work differently um I would say yes and no. Yeah, totally. Um, what I would say, and thank you for framing that, Kristen. What I would add to what you said, um, it's it's overwhelming. You know the yeah. the issues mm -hmm. yeah. that are happening in our communities, and I would say over the course of my last six years, uh, three years leading that organization, seven years, so three years leading a nonprofit, and then four years um, at this or organization that that's business focused. Um, what I've recognized is the power of policy, you know, mm -hmm. so what I would love to see uh, going forward is finding the right po partners, public, private, nonprofit, CGOs, all of those coming together to create policies that can make actual movement, because I feel like a lot of our nonprofits are doing great work in silos. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. And again, I'll speak I'll speak from my my experience in Tucson when I led that nonprofit, it focused on workforce development. Poverty in Tucson has persisted at around, 
20% for the last 25 years, the organization that I led, uh, we were seeing 90% graduation rates, 89% uh, job attainment rates, uh, uh, 40,000 plus uh, uh, salary increases. Wow. But poverty still persists yeah, in my yeah. community. And so to me, we have to look at it differently. And so so in addition to what you said about these successes, we can't look at it from an individual standpoint, because then if that were the case, and then the place I was at rocks, you know, yeah. <laughs> yet the community still suffers and, and it's not making the impact. And so any opportunities, what I've learned in the last seven years is collective impact. We need to find the right partners to create policies that can be embedded and really help our, our, our communities so that we're not at 20% for the next 25 years. Mm -hmm. So that would be my only addition is that's yeah. what I'm seeing is that I want to see more collective work, uh, partnerships, uh, private and public. Um, we need everybody involved to make, make the changes we need to make. Frank's like transformative language, <laughs> transformative gifts. No, I want to transform the whole sector. <laughs> That's it's, right. It is it where is. the work, I mean, we have in our community seen an impact from that kind of collective action yep. where we have a lot of strong policies that are creating protections in mm -hmm. our state that don't exist in some states. Mm -hmm. And I feel very lucky because I feel like we have some safety and resource in our state that is because there has been a mix of elected officials, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, multiple different causes rallying together in alignment with funding and grant funding organizations to create a policy agenda that has then created some protections. So I agree. I think that like we can't keep um, sort of pl just plugging the hole or putting the Band-Aid on, right? And so oh. often some of our missions are just that like temporary, you know, we're getting you through the day. But how do we, you know, not just feed someone, but how do we teach them how to fish? How do we, you know, yep. solve the bigger systemic issues? And to me, that is in transformative work, transformative collaborations, transformative language. So I think that this is in a door to walk through in order to start to do that bigger picture work. Yep. You have to believe it's yes. possible first. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And And that's, to me, what I hear some of this doing for organizations in sort of shifting perspectives is folks believing that yeah. they, that asset is possible yeah. versus continually being identified or identifying by deficit. It's, yeah. a, shif it's a paradigm yeah. shift in a lot of ways. I actually think we have a really um, salient, relevant way to frame this too, in that if you look in the media and the election, you can see, for example, one campaign is leading deficit based and one campaign oh, is leading a asset based. Absolutely. And you can see the impact of the asset base is creating a movement, right? And it is creating an energy and pulling in voters, people, individuals that haven't been or haven't felt like politics right. were for them. Right. Um, right. And that sense of creating and co-creating something bigger I think is really powerful it certainly is appealing to me from that sense of oh I want to dream beyond this I don't just want to fix the problems I want to dream of a different better future right. not just the band-aid solution so I think yeah. it's um, a really like very present <laughs> <laughs> example of yeah, yeah. how those language a choices example, make a difference through the ads, absolutely. Yeah. You can see one is completely deficit framed yeah. and the other one is asset based. Well, and I think they definitely speak to those who want to take collective action, those who want to be in, like a part of move into the asset based. And mm -hmm. if we're building missions, we want people moving into the work <laughs> we're doing. That's true. Well, sure. we're going to take a short promotional break. And when we come back, we're going to ask Frank to step into the fundraising elevator with us. So we'll be right back. Are you ready to engage supporters and grow your base with your own podcast? Then let us introduce you to our partners at the AV Department in Portland, Oregon. In addition to delivering exceptional live event audiovisual production and videography, they also have a top tier production studio and an expert team ready to take your content ideas to the next level. Contact the AV Department to schedule a consultation and start bringing your podcast vision to life.
Well, welcome back, Frank. Let's jump into the fundraising elevator where we're all headed up. Uh, we ask all of our guests for one tip, one recommendation for our frontline fundraisers about what they can do to head up. So if you were to give a little sage piece of advice or wisdom, what would you suggest? Well, I can sum it up in three words and then I'll, I'll explain. Um, but it's do no harm. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that I think one way you can do no harm is if you're writing a story about a client in a deficit framed way, imagine you're that client and would you want to be described in those ways and if you feel the ick um then <laughs> and shift shift to slick uh so so that's what i would recommend do no harm from ick to slick i love it it's a t-shirt <laughs> so <laughs> if folks want to learn more we're going to put a link to your introductory guide in using asset best lang based language in the show notes if folks want to get a hold of you if people want you to help take a look at some <laughs> of their stuff and point out kind of cast a little bit of light on where they can focus attention how should they do that oh so yeah code of for the hood.com it's the number four d-a-h-o-o-d.com um and that's the quickest and most immediate way to get a hold of me you'll see all the offerings uh but certainly yeah if you want a starting point i think this is a way to go and i feel it's relatively inexpensive uh for like an hour you know, consultation, consultation, bring some of your, your uh, documents that you've written in the past, and we'll look at it together and see, see how you can improve and go forward. Plus, you'll get access to a bunch of these, these uh, documents, as as you just mentioned, with the, the introductory guide to acid based language. Amazing. I love it. We will put a link to your site also in the show notes. Okay. And we super appreciate your time today. Oh, thanks for having me. You will be able to catch Frank, Sam and myself at the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference next week. The conference yeah. this year is in New Mexico, and we're super excited to explore storytelling more with you, Frank. Come say hi if you're Come there. Say hi if oh, you're there. for sure. Um, and friends out there listening, please join us next week when we talk to Joe Davis of On Point Community Credit, Credit Union all about events sponsorship from the sponsor's perspective. Get the inside track and be sure to tune in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV Department. The program is produced and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson, Heidi Christensen, and Adam Breeden. Video production by Shannon Doran. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group. Marketing by Lisa Aragon. Support from Mary Elizabeth, Todd Campbell, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett and voiceover by Josh Boykin. Friends, before we leave you, we want to ask for your help to make the podcast grow. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please like, follow, subscribe to The Fundraising Elevator. And if you're getting a lot out of the show, please share it with a friend and leave a review. These things help make sure that the podcast continues heading up. Thank you so much for tuning in. Ready to take your fundraising to the next level? Need to get unstuck in your event planning? Now's your chance to connect directly with the experts behind the Fundraising Elevator. Book a one-on-one -on -one consulting session with Sam for strategic planning and fundraising strategy, with Kristen for your program and storytelling, or Mary for your registration and data tools. They're here to provide you personalized answers to all your event questions. Don't wait, raise more at your next fundraising event. Book your session today at elevatenonprofit.com. You can also find the link in the show notes. Event planners are discovering Avenue, the Pacific Northwest's new AV Forward event venue, intentionally designed with nonprofit fundraising events in mind. From the 93-foot video production wall to the highest quality sound and lighting, Premier AV features are included in every venue rental. You'll find the space and audiovisual enhancements to create your unique and memorable event. Visit avenueportland.com to schedule your personal tour.